Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for making the trip out. Um, as Joe said, my name is Andrew Dorman. I'm a PhD candidate with the School of History and Geography here in DCU. And I'm being supervised by Professor James Kelly. Uh, my research generally is focused on the experience of soldiers in the 18th century, but, well, I'm only up here for five minutes and, well, I haven't written it yet. So instead, uh, I'm going to present on a small aspect of it, which is desertion reports in 18th century Ireland. And though first I should probably explain how I'm going about my research and military history, generally speaking, in the modern day. So, there's been a change in the way we look at military history these days. In the past, it was very much focused on battles and generals and bullet calibers and lots of minutia. However, these days, instead, we're looking at the more human stories. We're looking at the men who are being sent to die as opposed to those who are doing the sending, I suppose would be the nice way to put it. In Ireland, unfortunately, when, I'm, when looking at the 18th century, 90% of the records were destroyed in a fire in 1921 at the Customs House. We can thank Eamon de Valera for that. If we look closely, you can just about see chapter two of my thesis going up in smoke there. <laughs> Not that I'm bitter. Uh, <laughs> but this has led to me having to take a slightly more left field approach and taking in different kinds of sources, including memoirs, local diaries, and newspapers. And it is newspapers that I'm gonna focus on for this presentation. Specifically, the Dublin Journal. It was first published in 1727, but all of the things I'm taking from today were published in 1733. And what I would like you to bear in mind when I bring up the first of these desertion reports is that these are specifically designed so a member of the public can spot a soldier who has run away from the army in the street and report him to the authorities. So it includes their most identifiable characteristics. So here's the first one. We have this fellow here. His name, as you can see, is Thomas Marsh. He's born at Stoke, within three miles of the city of Westchester in England, where he has some pretensions to an estate, as he often repeats when he is drunk. We all know someone who blabs a bit when they're drunk, and if you don't, it's you. Uh, but what, we then, what then follows is a nice physical description of him. So we know he's 29 years of age, he's five foot eight and a quarter high, light brown hair, and has some facial scarring. And from this, what I'm able to do is actually create a picture as to what the average soldier might have actually looked like in the 18th century in Ireland. So he's probably called John. Um, I've looked at hundreds of them and you'd be surprised how many Johns come up. He has short brown hair, he's about five foot ten tall, but often they will have a stoop. Uh, 25 years of age, uh, he's from Northern England or Scotland, very few Irish in the ranks. Um, he's fresh faced, but often marked with smallpox, very common illness back then. And generally speaking, prior to the army, he's a weaver or a tailor. And this is a very different pattern to the idea we might often have of soldiers being you know, fresh out of education or just young conscripts dragged into the army. These guys have training and they're a little bit older than you might think and physically not dissimilar to Stephen. Um, <laughs> so you then you might be wondering why are they deserting from the army? And there's lots of different reasons for this. Sometimes they'll desert with friends, other times they're on the run from the army laws, or sometimes it's over a woman. Uh, here's one example, this fellow William White, uh, six, foot six foot tall, dark hair, handsome face, good looking lad. And then the description of his wife is slightly less flattering. Um, she's a middle-sized woman, a thin visage and a long nose. Speaks English as well as her husband like Londoners. What's, well, that's probably the worst part of it, to be honest. But uh, what's interesting about this is the amount of information that the army has about the wife of the soldier. And we're not really sure why they have all this information, and that's something I'm hoping to chase up in the duration of my thesis. And what's also, what's also important to note is that we have all these physical descriptions, and I gave an example of the average soldier. These are only the soldiers who desert, so perhaps all the six foot seven blondes stayed in the army, but we're making do with what we've got here, I suppose. Now, to finish up, I want to talk about why I'm doing this research, why this research matters. And some of you may say it doesn't, it's history, and that's because you're all in STEM, but, <laughs> but I'm, I'm playing to the crowd here. <laughs> but what, generally speaking, for historians, and I wouldn't be accused of calling people partisan, but historians are notoriously partisan, and the Irish military establishment doesn't really feature with the traditional narrative we like to have of the 800 years of English oppression, perfidious Albion, the worst next door neighbor in history. It doesn't, it doesn't fit. But what I've discovered is that people are living in pretty much harmony. Things are fairly normal between the various groups. And as you can see, the two most comprehensive histories of Ireland do not dedicate a single chapter to what I'm looking at at my PhD. And given this fairly substantial impact of these soldiers in the social and political structure of Ireland, I think that this is a massive disservice. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for listening to me.